John Fuhrer once received a letter from a meditator in Singapore saying that his practice was to go through life seeing how things were inconstant, stressful, and not self. And John Fuhrer told me to write, back, <coughs> to write back, saying, the problem isn't with things out there. Turn around look at the mind. In other words, the fact that things change is not a big deal. The problem is the mind is looking for its happiness and things that change. Looking for its happiness in things that are stressful, in happiness for things that are not self. It's that search for happiness that's the thing we have to look at. Because on the one hand, the search for true happiness is not to be criticized. It's a good thing. It's because we're looking for true happiness that ordinary happiness is not enough. And our ordinary desires are something that we have to investigate, the ones that pull us away from a true happiness to, for something that's going to let us down. That's where the problem is. It's not that we believe that things don't change. We know that things change, and we know that there's stress in the world. And there are a lot of things out there that are not ours or not us. And yet our equation is some things are worth the effort. Even though they're impermanent, the effort that goes into at least having a taste it gets paid off by the pleasure, as the Buddha once said. It's because there's pleasure in the five aggregates that we fall for them. It's not necessarily the case that we think that they're permanent or that they're substantial or that they really belong to us, but there's pleasure there. And that's what we go for. And as in any case, there's an equation that goes on in the mind, some calculation. If I put in X amount of effort, is it worth the pleasure that comes out of it? That's what we have to look at, because all too often our equation is skewed, it's like those billboards they used to have on the way into Las Vegas. Casinos bragging with their 95% payback rate or 98% payback rate, basically telling you you give them a dollar and they'll give you 98 cents back. And yet people don't see that. All they can think about is maybe there's that one chance that you know, they can beat the system, that someone else will be the, the sucker who gets the fifty cents back. I want to get a hundred. I want to get a dollar and fifty cents back on my dollar. That kind of thinking. This is why we bring the mind to concentration, so that we can have a more objective way of looking at the equation. When the mind can settle down with the breath. Get engaged with this investigation in the present moment. What is this breath energy in the body? What can it be used for? It can be used for a lot of things. It can help with pain management. It can soothe you when you're feeling disturbed or irritated. It can provide you with a comfortable home when you're feeling alienated from the world around you. that can provide the mind with a better place to feed. That's the Buddha's primary image for the activity of the mind. When we take on the identity of a being, we have to feed. That's the first thing he teaches in the series of ten questions that novices were supposed to learn. What's one? Or what is one? And the answer is not all beings are one or anything metaphysical. It's all beings subsist on food. Everybody's got to eat. And it's not just physical food, it's mental food. We feed on our emotions, we feed on other people's emotions, we feed on status, power, recognition, whatever. 
then it's because we're hungry that we don't see things clearly. This is why the Buddha has us feed on nice state of concentration. You get your sense of well-being from within, and it's a lot more under your control. It's something you can tap into at any time. When you get used to being nourished in this way, then you look at the nourishment that you used to seek in sights, sounds, smells, tastes, tactile sensations, and ideas, and you begin to see that in a lot of cases it's just not worth the effort. The pleasure you get may be there, but it's not nearly the same as the pleasure you get from concentration. It's not nearly as satisfying. It involves a lot more unpleasantness either just in terms of the effort that's got to be put in, and, or sometimes some of the things you've got to do in order to gain those pleasures. Not quite upright, not quite honest. You're better off without them. In other words, bringing the mind into concentration changes the equations. You're in a better position to see what's worth the effort and what's not. And so when you see that something is inconstant, if it's something you used to feed on but now you see it's not worth it anymore, that inconstancy goes to, right to the heart. The realization of inconstancy goes right to the heart. You see the stress and it's not worth it. And as for the teaching on not-self, notice that the Buddha never has you conclude if something is inconstant, then it's stressful. If it's stressful, he doesn't have you include, there is no self. He has you include, it's not worth calling it yourself or trying to claim it as you or yours. That's all he's asking you to conclude from this analysis. In other words, is it something you want to latch on to? Is it something you want to take in? And you begin to realize, no, it's not worth it. I've got something better. So this is why it's so important to develop powers of concentration. Even stream enterers have to work on their concentration because they still haven't seen deeply enough as to what's really worth the effort and what's not. Now the concentration is worth the effort. All the elements of the path are worth the effort because the Happiness they lead you to is something that passes all those tests. Is it constant? Yes. Is it stressful? No. And at that point you don't even need a sense of self because it's just there. Our sense of self is something that has its uses, you know. This is another one of the strange things you hear sometimes around the three, what they call characteristics. You know, only people realize that the idea of a self doesn't make any sense or it's a flawed concept, then they would just let it go. Well, people don't let go of things, or people don't hang on to things, excuse me, unless it's got a purpose of some kind, serves some use. And it turns out your sense of self has a very long list of uses. As the Buddha said, you use yourself as your governing principle to keep you on the path. You ask yourself, what kind of happiness do you want? Do you want to go back to the old happiness that you had before, the old pleasures you had before, or do you want something more noble? There's a sense of self in, implied there. Or is it, there's the, what they call the conceit. Other people can do this, why can't I? There's a self, sense of self there as well. It's responsible, it's competent, and it's confident. That kind of self you need as you're on the path. You don't let that go until you've reached total awakening. So you have to realize the sense of self does have its purposes, it does have its uses. This is why when you say things are inconstant, stressful, and not self, people don't go bingo and hit nirvana. You look at your feeding habits. What are you feeding on right now? And you want to develop a, an understanding, or you want to develop a perspective on the ways you've been feeding to see that it's not worth it anymore.
Now, if you're hungry, you're just going to keep on wanting to feed regardless. That's where we have the practice of concentration, is to feed the mind better food, so it's not hungry all the time. And then you keep analyzing, looking at your actions. To what extent are you doing things that are stressful, that are unnecessary and are not worth it? You look all around yourself and you sort out your old habits, relationships, pastimes, ha hobbies, whatever. You begin to see a lot of these things just aren't worth the effort put into them. And whether it's because they're inconstant or they're stressed or whatever, that's not the issue. It's seeing that it's not something you want to feed on anymore. It's this quality of nibida, losing your sense of taste for something. That's the important thing. Whatever the perception is that induces it, that's what we're looking for. But it really hits home only if it's some area where you've been feeding. I mean, you can look at the inconstancy of trees and it just goes right past you. And say, so, oh yes, human history is inconstant. All kinds of things are inconstant. Well, that's just the way things are, and it's no great news. But if it's something you've been feeding on and you can see that this is not worth it anymore, that's when these perceptions have done their job, because they're looking at the fact that not the things out there are inconstant, but that you've been devoting yourself to something that's not worth it. That's when you let go. So you've got to keep these teachings in perspective. Remember, the mind is not passive. We're not here watching TV shows and deciding whether we want to like them or not. We're constantly feeding. We're constantly looking where it's the next place to feed. What are we going to feed on next? And the purpose of the concentration is to take some of the edge off of those questions so you can look from a larger perspective, step back a bit, and look at your feeding habits, realizing there's better food for the mind. And keep on feeding your good food. It finally gets strong enough that it can stand on its own. It doesn't need to feed anymore. That's when the mind lets go of everything, and yet it's not poor. As a John Lee once said, the Buddha doesn't have us let go like paupers. We let go like rich people. So much good in the mind that it doesn't need to carry anything around.